Oh, I feel like I've already been in church tonight. And boy, I tell you what, God's all over the place up in this area. How about out there? Amen. Amen. Boy, I tell you, there ain't nothing like it, Brother Bob. I appreciate you sharing that, what God laid on your heart with us tonight, and the good songs the choir sung, and the opening song. And boy, I tell you one thing, it has really been good tonight to have been in the house of the Lord. Uh, I just, I've been to uh, Fanny Crosby's grave. Went on a Baptist historical tour. And uh, when we got there at the graveyard, large, I mean massive graveyard, and the first place that the teachers took us to was this giant monument, giant monument. And I mean, it reached 20 some feet, maybe bigger than that. I mean, a big pinnacle, all this stuff, big old surrounding granite and black wrought iron and all this stuff like that. And the teacher said, well, who do you think's buried here? Of course, you know, we didn't have no clue. We we're on Baptist tour, you know, we think maybe some preacher or something like that. Uh, it was little Tom Thumb's uh, grave. <laughs> Worked for bring, uh, being uh, Barnum and, t- help me out. Barnum and Bailey Circus. He was the shortest man in the world or something like that. But anyway, when he died, he had this humongous uh, uh, grave site there that was a, uh, uh, their form gravestone. And then a few moments later, the teacher took us, you know, not too far from that place, was walking, went over this one little place, and I call it Old Soapstone, and it had already been weathered and already had, you know, really been deteriorating. It wasn't hardly, you know, you've probably seen them, but hardly sticking up out of the ground, no bigger than that. And, and on a tombstone, I think it says, Blessed Assurance. It was Fanny Crosby's grave. It was Fanny Crosby's grave. Now, since then, some of the different uh, societies or something like that, I think they put a, like a normal size granite stone there. But that's the kind of humble person because she wrote, what, 8,000 songs and sold hundreds of millions of copies. And we're still singing them songs today. And what a humble soul. But boy, can't you imagine what heaven was like when she got there. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. I can't help this, but I've got to try it one, one time. Jesus. Okay, I better go back to plan A then. <clears throat> All right. Well, if you will, please tonight turn with me in your Bibles for a little bit. <laughs> you had your chance, you know. You <laughs> Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 covers one of the last or the last recorded sermon from Jesus. It's a part of the last recorded sermon from Jesus. You read uh, all of the discourse here, and you'll find out Jesus is preaching and teaching. And it's amazing what one of the topics is that Jesus used before he went to the cross of Calvary. And uh, we're going to look at that topic tonight. And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. But it's one of the last sermon. It is the last sermon. It's a part of the last sermon that Jesus preached before he went to the cross of Calvary. And uh, I, I bet you can't even imagine what the topic is. But if you will, please stand with me now as I begin reading from the book of Matthew, chapter number 23. And I'm going to read through this passage of Scripture. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sat in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do, but do not you after their works... For they say and do not. In other words, he's saying they say one thing and do another. All right? For they, for they bind heavy burdens and grievousness to the board and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for the, to be seen of man. They make broad their physiotaries phys, uh, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uttermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogue, and greetings in the market, and to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not you called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ." But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, 
And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Our Heavenly Father, we do bow before you tonight. And Lord, it's been good. I've enjoyed it, dear Heavenly Father, just being here. Hearing these wonderful songs and just a good time of fellowship, dear Lord. And Lord, here I am getting to approach the throne of grace. I'm being able to talk to God here tonight in this prayer through Jesus. And God, I'm thankful, dear God, for all you're doing for us. And I'm thankful, dear God, for what you got in store yet to come. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us, dear Heavenly Father, to, to uh, glean from this passage of Scripture. And help us, dear Heavenly Father, to apply these things to our lives that we might be better servants of thee. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that is done in your name for these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. And you may be seated tonight. Boy, I tell you, while Jesus Christ was here on earth, he only ministered basically for three years. He was about 30 years old when he entered into the public ministry. Now, of course, when he was 12 years old, he went back to the temple just like it was their custom to do. And he met with the scribes and the Pharisees there, and he gave them a great lesson about some of the Old Testament uh, uh, scriptures. And, of course, Jesus Christ being here on the earth during that time, I'm sure that there were times when Jesus was able to speak or help or do certain things, but those things are not recorded. We actually don't have any recordings of what was transpiring in Jesus' life by the time he was 12 to the time he enters into the Jordan River there where John is baptizing when he's 30 years old. And when he was 30 years old, he continued to serve God here on earth for 33 years. He knew that his time was short here on earth. He knew that the cross at Calvary was waiting for him. He knew all this. And he knew the day would come when he would die, but he also knew the day was going to come when he would be victorious over the grave. He knew in his heart that because he is the Son of God that he would arise from the dead itself. And he remained here on this earth after he had died and arose from the grave for 40 days, the Bible tells us. And then at the end of that 40-day period of time, the Bible again tells us that Jesus, being the Son of God, was able to do the extraordinary that right there before his disciples, he began to levitate. He began to ascend. He began to go up into the air right there in the very presence of those that were eyewitnesses to those accounts, and they documented it in the Word of God. But who was it that you think that during that three-year period of time gave Jesus Christ the hardest time? Who was it that kept after him? Who was it that denied him? Who was it that wouldn't believe him? Who was it that set traps trying to get this against him and that against him? Well, first of all, I might would have thought, well, the Roman government surely wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with Jesus. But you're going to find out that through the studying about Jesus that Rome really didn't care much about Jesus one way or another. Matter of fact, even when Pontius Pilate had Jesus Christ on trial, even under pressure, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Well, you think, well, if the Roman government wasn't putting pressure on him and causing him all kinds of problems and troubles, then who was it that was causing him difficulties the most? Well, you think about King Herod. He was a wicked man. His father was a wicked man. And King Herod here was just a pawn of the Roman government. But yet it wasn't King Herod that gave Jesus Christ the hardest time. Matter of fact, when they sent Jesus to Herod, Herod just wanted Jesus to put on a performance. He just wanted Jesus to perform some miracles. He had heard about this Jesus, but he hadn't heard enough that he had drawn a conclusion that, well, this man Jesus is dangerous to us. He didn't even think that. Matter of fact, he didn't cast judgment on Jesus himself. He sent Jesus back to Pilate for Pilate to handle the situation. But Jesus here is going to address the people that caused him the most problems and difficulties and tried their utmost to hinder him during that three-year period of time of ministry. If you go back into chapter number 22 of Matthew, you'll find that these different uh, people, these different groups, kept coming up against Jesus Christ. You can find out there in chapter number 22 that they come up against Jesus Christ and the religious leaders question Jesus about paying taxes. Now that's spiritual. Now wouldn't you consider that spiritual? I don't want nobody mentioning taxes to me while I'm in church. 
because it has nothing to do with my spirituality and it'll get me in the flesh probably quick as anything I, I can know of because, well, I don't like paying no more than I have to. Let me put it that way. But here they come trying to entrap him. And what were they going to entrap him with? They were going to entrap him about taxes. Well, then another religious group come along and a religious leader questioned Jesus Christ about the resurrection. The Sadducees were a very powerful religious sect there in Israel at this particular time. But the Sadducees, they did not believe in life after death. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in any of these other things. That's why they were so sad, you see. Because it was only in this life that they had anything going good for them. But they questioned Jesus Christ about the resurrection. Friends, I'm glad, thank God, there is a resurrection. I'm thankful that God has the power to raise the dead. Because one of these days, this old body's going to cease to function and, pra and praise be unto God. I know that my heavenly Father's got the power because Jesus says, because I live, you shall live also. Boy, ain't that exciting? Boy, I'm thankful that he's got the power. Well, Jesus Christ confronted them about the taxes. He confronted them about the resurrection. Jesus Christ was questioned about the greatest commandment. What's the greatest commandment? And all these different things, they kept coming at Jesus Christ and kept coming at Jesus Christ. So finally, right here, Jesus Christ just tells it like it is. Now I'm saying this to say that when we stand before the Lord, don't you expect him to candy coat it. He's gonna say it just like it is. He's gonna tell it just like we did. And matter of fact, when he's standing here, the people that gave him the most trouble during that three-year period of time of ministry on this earth, while he was healing people, while he was giving people their sight back, while he was raising people up who had been paralyzed all their life, while Jesus Christ in a crowd was able to gather together and call back Lazarus from the dead, when Jesus Christ was able to take a few loaves and fishes and Jesus Christ was able to fo uh, feed thousands of people, Jesus Christ was able to control the storms and say, peace, be still. Jesus Christ was able to heal the leopard. Jesus Christ was able to do all these kinds of miracles, but these blind religious people kept after him. They did not accept him as the Son of God. And Jesus Christ, in this passage of Scripture throughout chapter 23, he's going to address the Pharisees. He's going to address the Sadducees. And he's going to call them hypocrites. Now, there's been a lot of times I've been out trying to invite people to come to church, and, one, and on, on, well, on kind of a regular occasion, Somebody will say, well, I'm not going to church there with all them hypocrites. Well, I tell you one thing, I'd rather go to church with a few hypocrites than to wind up in hell with all of them. Amen? But they say, I'm not going to go to church with them hypocrites. Well, Jesus Christ is going to use the word hypocrite here about seven different times. And in this passage of Scripture, not only is he going to call them out, and tell them that they're hypocrites, but he's gonna say woe unto you about eight different times. Woe unto you, you hypocrites. So I think that might be helpful for us to first of all to understand what a hypocrite is. Now these are Jesus' words. They're not my words. This is what Jesus has said. And he didn't just use this term once, but he used it many different times. And he was using this to address that crowd that kept trying to hinder him. As a matter of fact, Satan would use that religious crowd to nail him to the cross, to send him to his death, which he became victorious over, and God knew that that was going to happen, but rest assured it wasn't the Romans, and it wasn't Herod. It was that religious crowd that wanted to do away with him. So what is a hypocrite? Well, a hypocrite by definition and I believe I got it there, Brother Randy, thank you. Hypocrite, the Bible says here, a person who indulges in hypocrisy. I can't stand that when a dictionary does that. If I knew what a hypocrite was or hypocrisy was, I wouldn't have looked it up to begin with. 
Where's well, just a hypocrisy, people? I'm, give me something else. A person who indulges in hypocrisy. Now let's look at it again. What does it say in the synonym? It says it's a pretender. What's a hypocrite, church? A pretender. But not only are they pretender, but you can go and say deceiver. It's a liar. You can go and say all these different things here. A phony, a fraud, a sham, a fake. Now Jesus Christ, whew, what do you think he's going to call us? <laughs> Man, he said, these are hypocrites. What is he saying? You are a pretender. You are a liar. You are a deceiver. You are a phony. You are a fraud. You are a sham. You are a fake. <laughs> Woo! Well, I'm telling you right now <laughs> that that's it. Man, he lays it right on the line just like it is. They know what it meant. A lot of people today still trying to figure out what's hypocrisy because you don't know what hypocrite is. But that's what hypocrite is right there in that passage of Scripture. That's what Jesus is calling these religious people. And of all the people that existed during that time of Jesus' ministry, isn't it sad to say that that religious crowd was a prime example of hypocrisy? Fake, phony, sham artists and things of that nature. A hypocrite, no doubt about it, is someone, particularly in the days of Greek theater, was someone who acted on a stage. It's an actor. Matter of fact, when a Greek person was talking about a hypocrite, it wasn't taken in such a harsh way as we take it today because it was just saying like we'd say, hey, there's a movie star. A hypocrite. A hypocrite is somebody pretending to be something that they're not. That's, who's that? <laughs> Did I touch on that this morning? An actor. Somebody who's pretending. And Jesus says, you religious people, y'all are pretenders. You are a hypocrite. And the Pharisees were some of the greatest and the great pretenders of their day. Boy, I'm telling you right now, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus Christ exposes why he calls them a hypocrite. Now listen to this. Jesus don't just use a word just to be filling up space. Have you ever been around some people that use some of these big words just to try to impress you? And you're sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and you're sitting there nodding your head, and, oh, yeah, 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 I, I know exactly. Yo, I agree with you 100%. You know? Jesus didn't use words just try to impress people. Jesus here not only used the word hypocrite to describe the Pharisees, this religious crowd, the anarchy of the religious people, but he went on and defined exactly what was going on that caused him to label them a pretender. And we look into this passage of Scripture tonight, and we can find many places here in this passage of Scripture that clearly shows us that they are a hypocrite, a pretender. Now let me ask you something before we get any further. How many of you at times in your life would be willing to admit that you've been a hypocrite? Okay, there's several, and then the rest of you are there pretending <laughs> to be something that you're not. We've all been hypocrites. Church is filled with hypocrites. When they don't want to come and be in a church with hypocrites, well, friends, they ain't going to find a church that don't have hypocrites. We all are hypocrites at times in my life. For some that said, well, I've really never been a hypocrite. How many of you have ever sat there like you understood what was going on and you didn't have a clue? You were pretending to be something you wasn't. So what does the Bible say you are? You're a hypocrite. How many of you have ever acted glad when inside, inside you were sad? You're pretending to be happy. Sit there with that smile's on your face. <laughs> Try to pull the wool over my eyes. Inside you in torment. Inside you feel terrible. Inside you are going through a worse time in your life, but you're being a pretender. Amen? Amen. How many of you ever, ever 
like everything, uh, acted like everything was fine. Remember them kids that come about five years ago or something like that, and they did that little skit about, yeah, I'm fine. Huh? How many of you, when somebody asks you something, and how you doing? Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And inside you ain't fine. So what are you doing? You're pretending. And a pretender is what? A hypocrite. Somebody acting, somebody trying to portray something outwardly that they're nowhere near being inwardly. Amen? Amen. So how many of us now have ever been a hypocrite? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a terrible hypocrite. I've been one many times over. Here it really gets down to the nitty gritty, and here's what Jesus is trying to approach here, especially because it's so important and it's so, vi so vital. But here sometimes, you know, we'll put on an outward funny face, but then we're, we're just going through some of the worst depression a person could face. You don't know what's going on in the heart of somebody sitting beside you. You might look at them and they might be smiling. And they might even try to chuckle. But inside, they're going to a dark place. Oh, my friends, tonight, you don't have to be a hypocrite here. But then Jesus Christ is dealing with that religious crowd, and here's where it really hurts the most, I really believe. How many times have you ever been called upon to pray? And you went through the motions of it. But you know you wasn't right with God. You know your prayer wasn't reaching heaven. But you weren't about to confess, well, preacher, I, you know, or... Teacher, I, well, you know, I, I, I better not pray right now. My throat's a little sore. <laughs> but you went ahead and pretended to pray when somebody's health was on the line. You pretended to pray when somebody's salvation was standing at the door. You pretended it. To go ahead and pray just like you and God was as close as you've ever been. Just like you was walking with God. And there's some drug addict. There's some alcoholic. There's somebody that really needs somebody that can reach heaven for them. And you're standing there pretending. And God here is saying, woe unto you. How many times have you ever sung a song? And you wasn't right with God. You know you wasn't right with God. But you sung that song anyway. And God needed somebody to be singing a song that day that comes straight from the portals of glory that would have reached out into that congregation or that classroom or where it might have been. God was needing somebody that day not to be pretending but to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God and to get up there and allow the Spirit of God to sweep throughout that auditorium. You ever done that? You ever sang up in the choir and you, you know you wasn't right with God? You wish you wouldn't have come, don't you? What about teaching a Sunday school lesson? Has there ever been a time you didn't really want to do it? Huh? There ever been time on Saturday evening you just didn't really want to spend the time studying and you had a lot of other things you could have been doing? I tell you, I admire teachers, singers, everybody that practices and gives their time to the Lord like that. I'm telling you, it's amazing. But there's been times I've taught Sunday school for I don't know how many different years and I, I, there was times when I said, oh, oh, Lord, I don't, want to, I don't want to study tonight. I just don't want to do it. And you want to go into the classroom the next morning and you stand up there and just like you walking with God, it's y'all hand in hand and the best of buddies and he's just giving you something from the throne of grace and you're going to stand up there and handle the word of God and you ain't no more closer to God than there's a man living in the moon. I want to tell you right now, in the classroom ain't a time to be pretending. You don't have that much time to pretend. 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes in a classroom out of a whole week. But I ain't going to stop right there. 
I'm going to go on into some preaching. You want to know if I've ever got up and preached just because, well, it's Sunday morning, it's 11 o'clock, and I better be on the scene, and I better do something for God, whether I really believe that, well, I'm ready to do it or not. I want to tell you one thing. That's a hypocrite. That's a pretender. When you know that you've got to have the peace of God on you and the direction of God on you and the anointing of God on you and the power of God on you to bring forth what God's people stand in need of and you get up there and dilly-dally around, you talk about every comic book character in the, in the book and you give these lollipop kind of sermons and you pat everybody on the back and try to make everybody happy, I want to tell you right now, you're a hypocrite. So how many of us have been hypocrites now? We've all been hypocrites. And Jesus Christ points out here why he considered these Pharisees to be hypocritical. And this is why he said, one of these days, you're not going to escape it. Matter of fact, he says there in that one last verse that I read to you, not only do hypocrites help drag other people into hell, they themselves ain't going to make it either. You can put on a front that you are a Christian, but that don't mean you are a Christian. You can tell people that you are saved. I think what Bob was saying about Fanny Cross, we've been in a church probably all our life, heard all these different scriptures and things like that. Friends, I went through that motion when I was about 12 years old myself. I lived a hypocritical life until I was about 21 years old. Somebody asked me if I was saved. I said, oh, yeah, I'm saved. Get off my back. Oh, yeah, I was saved. I went and got baptized. Oh, yeah, I was saved. I went down to the front of the church. I was just a hypocrite. I was pretending. I was a liar. And I'd have busted hell wide open if I wouldn't have one day been given a chance by an almighty merciful God to have been saved. And I believe for that one last time. Boy, I'm a hypocrite. I've been a hypocrite at times. And God says, I'm taking notice of you. And I know when you're pretending and I know when you ain't. And so he tries to tell these Pharisees and Sadducees, this religious crowd, who was up there worrying about his tax returns. Worrying about was he going to live after death. They worried about why are your disciples getting a handful of wheat on the side of the road on the Sabbath and y'all sitting there grinding the husk off of it and you're working on the Sabbath just to feed yourself on a Saturday. Why they come up to Jesus Christ and said, why did you heal that man on a Sabbath? Here Jesus Christ is turning back to him now and it's about his last message, close to some of the last words that he's going to say before he goes to the cross of Calvary. And one of the things he brings out about the hypocrites was the fact that they did things so that people would admire them. Friends, I'm not here to try to win you over to me. I'm not here, I'm really not here in some kind of political campaign. I'm not trying to win you to me, I'm trying to win you to Jesus Christ. I know not everybody's going to like me. I know that. The Bible says, beware if every man thinks good of you. But I've been sent here today not to draw you to me. I'm not wanting to build this church on my personality. I want to point people to Jesus Christ. But these people were hypocritical, pretending to be religious, pretending to be godly people. But all they were doing was seeking glory for themselves. We find out here in this passage of scriptures that they were admired people. We find out here in these scriptures that they taught strict religious principles and they expected more out of other people and they put burdens on people saying that this is what you should do, this is how to do it, and, and this is why you should do it, but they wouldn't do it themselves. Boy, you ever been caught up in that crowd of religious religious. <coughs> People that are just uh, legalistic. Have you ever been in that legalistic crowd? Anybody here ever been in that legalistic crowd? I want to tell you right now, it just about robs you of your spirit, doesn't it? I've been in crowds sometimes that, my goodness, if you had a beard on your face, you couldn't have been saved. My goodness, Jesus had a beard. Come on. Some people think, well, if you ain't got a town, how in the world are you going to preach? I want to tell you right now, I ain't never been able to preach because I've had a town. Matter of fact, I told one of the fellas not long ago, I said it's probably hindered me more than it's ever helped me. Chokes me to death. I can't stand it. I don't have a town today because, well, simply I'm going to use the excuse I couldn't tie it with my hand the way it is. 
I'm not saying I hope the Lord leaves this on my hand for the next six months, but... <clears throat> oh, Lord, help me. Jesus. <laughs> oh, y'all were tough. <laughs> they sought the praise of man. Uh, they sought their own advancement. Look at verse number five and look at verse number six. When we look at verse number five and verse number six, look at that. Uh, but all their works they do for the, to be seen of man. Uh, they might brawl their physolectarius. Have you ever seen on television these little square leather boxes that they put on their forehead? Have you ever seen that on some movie, something like that? Some devout Jewish person wears a little band around their head and they got this little tiny box up there. Well, you'll see it once in a while. Sometimes they put it on their left arm around their elbow. They tie it on there with a piece of leather. Anyway, they're going back into the Old Testament where so-and-so, so-and-such. They're, they're, they're going, and Jesus here is saying, you can wear that little square leather box on the front of your forehead all you want to, but you ain't nothing but a hypocrite. You know the only reason you're wearing that little weather, leather box on the front of your forehead like that. And matter of fact, I've taken notice of how wide you made it. And the only reason you're wearing it is so people will recognize you. You are a hypocrite. Woe unto you. But not only did he say that about that little leather box. What's inside the leather box? They put Old Testament scriptures uh, written down on paper and they put it in that leather box and they're supposed to be using that during their prayer time or whatever, you know. They go up to the well and wall. If you ever seen that, they have a, some of the devout Jews of the day, <clears throat> not many of them do it as much as they used to, but today they go up to that and they get up there and they pray and have that little leather box there and so forth and so on. These Pharisees, Sadducees, these pretenders were trying to have the outward appearance of being so godly, but Jesus seen through their, their sheep's clothing and he, and he knows that they were nothing but wolves. Whew. Jesus. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. But they didn't only uh, put the leather boxes on and Jesus said, I see through that. <laughs> on their prayer, prayer shawl, <laughs> they wanted people to know that they were somebody. You know, we're special. We're better than you, really. We're more religious than you are. I, look at my, hey, look at the box. Keep your eyes on the box. But on their prayer shawls, that's what he's saying here in this passage of Scripture. He is saying this, and grieves to be born, and they laid on them man's shoulders and so forth like that. And all their works they do was to be seen a man, all right? And they even on their garments they enlarged the borders of their garments on their prayer shawl. They'd make the tassels a whole lot longer. They'd make the borders a whole lot wider. And so when they would walk around somewhere, boy, they were somebody to be recognized. And he said, you're nothing but a hypocrite. You can have all the outward appearances that you want to have. And man, the Bible says, look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And God knows whether or not you are a pretender, or he knows whether or not you are for sure. But you can read all this passage of Scripture. I can't believe that it's, we are supposed to have been out here an hour ago, wasn't we? <laughs> Bulldog said 5 o'clock we're starting. <clears throat> but here I I want you to go home and study this and, and see where Jesus just points them out. Jesus just says, look at this. You ain't got no wool pulled over my eyes. I know exactly what you are. I know exactly what you're capable of. You might pretend the people in front of you and beside you and behind you, you might, you might pull the wool over your preacher's eyes, but I'm telling you right now, one of these days you're going to stand before God and God's going to say you are a pretender. You said you were saved, you wasn't saved. You said you loved God. You didn't love God. You said you couldn't wait to get to heaven, but don't take me now, Lord. You ready for the rapture? Not today, Lord. Read all these different things and you'll find out, my goodness, all these things that they were doing, all the corruption that was going on in the hierarchy of the, of the temple priests and things of that nature. But I'm going to close with this passage of Scripture here, verse number 13. Look at this. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, 
neither suffer you them that are enticing to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows. They took advantage of, of people that, that had properties and, and things of that nature. They talked them into, oh, let us handle your, your uh, estates. Uh-huh. You ever seen that on television, some of them, some of them guys? Hey, we, we, you let us handle it. We need some more golden uh, faucets in our dog house and our uh, air-conditioned systems in our, our uh, dog houses and things like that. Let us handle it, you hypocrite, you pretender. Woe unto you, scribes and hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the, um, the child of hell than yourself. Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by this, that, and another. Boy, I tell you, Jesus Christ was laying it on them. And he said, you're taking a lot of people with you. You're winning people to yourself was their goal. That's what Jesus said. You go out and proselyte. And you make them twofold, the child of hell. Because when you go out and you convince them to follow you, to follow what you say, to do what you tell them to do instead of what God says to do and what God wants them to do. When you tell them that, friends, God is saying, you're, you're just dooming them people with false doctrine, false security. And you're going to hell yourself. You can't even recognize the Son of God standing right there before you and you had every advantage. You had every scripture. Everything pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And you, yourselves, are sitting here trying to crucify him. You hypocrites. You think you got me fooled, Jesus is saying. You ain't got me fooled and you ain't got God fooled. Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> How about it tonight? Has there been times that, well... You just carried on to be carried on. You just went through the motions of it. Instead of being in real close fellowship with God, you just went through the formalities of godliness, denying the what? The power. Denying the power. And you wonder what's going to get accomplished without the power of God? Nothing. Nothing. And so much is at stake. Souls, healings, miracles. And God is saying, I know you are a hypocrite. I know you're pretending. I know you're not what you say you are. Maybe tonight, God's rung your bell. Maybe tonight, God has said, I know your heart tonight. I know you're not saved. And I know that unless you get saved, you're going to bust hell wide open. Woe unto you you hypocrite woe unto you that may be leading others to hell as well oh you hypocrite you may be leading your family to hell they might be following in your footsteps and you're leading them to hell maybe your best friends they might be following you to hell God speaking I really believe with hearts tonight and if anybody needs to come for any reason whatsoever you come now our Heavenly Father, have your way during this time of invitation for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Anybody that needs to come, maybe you need to be saved. Maybe tonight you need to get right with God. Whatever it is, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Don't be a hypocrite. Don't walk out of here like everything's right and you know it's not right. Don't walk out of here tonight no, and, think, and let people think, well, oh my goodness. And you know in your heart it ain't right. You know it ain't right. Anybody that needs to come, would you come? Bless your hearts for being here tonight. I hope you all have a real good week and reach out and lift up Jesus before people that you come in contact with and invite them to come to know Jesus if they don't know Jesus. Invite them to come to church if they're not going to church anywhere. We'd love to have them here. So be much in prayer one for another. Let's be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again 
for how that you have walked within our midst today. And Lord, lead us now in the ways you'd have us to go. For these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.